if any of y'all that came in a little late, I will mention again that I am not Dr. Olds. I was filling in for her because she did have a family emergency. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears, um, which would have been her transferring to me to, to the next presentation that we have on the list, which is going to be talking about other flies. So we just have kind of gone through house flies, pesticide resistance, and management systems when it comes to more focusing on house flies, but a lot of that overlaps into all of our flies. Uh, so now we're going to start talking about some other flies that you may be dealing with with if you're dealing with beef cattle and even horses in the sense, because um, when we're dealing with the animals themselves, we then have a tendency to see different fly species than if we're dealing with a barn only associated issue or with poultry. So the flies that I'm going to talk about here, uh, again, like I said, have more of an impact when it comes to our cattle industry. And these are considered external parasites and they're known to cost a two point four billion dollars annually just to the beef cattle industry. Uh, and most of this is going to be our horn flies themselves. They are a 1.75 billion dollar impact just them on their own. And then we add in stable flies which is a two point million dollar impact and then I'm also going to talk briefly about horse flies and they're also an impact to our industries. And that's only counting the beef and not including all the situations outside of the beef when we're dealing with horses and then if you add in the dairy situations as well. It's very important to manage these flies in as many ways as possible as I just talked about integrated approaches. We're going to talk about some more of those because these are biting flies and they do have an impact directly in both transmission of pathogens and just the impact of feeding on your animals. So again, we're still dealing with fill flies, right? House flies are fill flies. Horn flies are fill flies, stone flies are fill flies. And well, what is a fill fly? So this is a term that's utilized to talk about flies that prefer these similar substrates, which are usually of not the most pleasant type, right? A filthy organic substrate, which is usually garbage and manure, dead animals, animal bedding. And they use those for their advantage. You know, a lot of times they like to tell people they're actually decomposers. They're actually helping us get rid of this substrate that is really not pleasant, but the, adver the adversity of having them is not a great thing, right? We have the adverse is that we have now biting flies or we have all these flies around. So that's not a benefit to it. A lot of the members in this group are going to have similar mouth parts. The sponging mouth parts are the ones we see on our, our um, house flies and our blow flies. And they're really good at picking up pathogens like bacteria and transmitting those further, which can be extremely problematic. And then we also have a lot with biting um, or piercing sucking mouth parts, which they bite with. And those are very painful. And sometimes those can also pick up pathogens that are in the blood uh, and move that further. So again, we're kind of talking about just a small grouping of these of flies in general. So our muskins, our califords, and our sarks, and those are going to be, again, our house flies, horn flies, stable flies, and our blow flies. Even with horn flies and stable flies, similar as with the house flies, are going to lay those eggs in groups. They do put them in clusters. It helps with the development of those larvae and it helps them to break down whatever resource they're trying to utilize, whether it's manure or decomposing vegetation or a dead animal. Um, having these clusters allows for those larvae to grow together, referred to as maggots. They are unable to break down substrates very well by themselves. So they have this system of where they actually kind of throw up onto the food their digestive fluids, and then they kind of help that to break their substrates down. So the more of them that are there, the better that works for them and allows them to feed and grow faster. Um, so they do need a substrate with moisture, but not a wet substrate. They do not grow in water that will actually kill them. The pupil stage is the last stage again before adults. That's the exoskeleton then hardens for those for those larvae, and then they go through metamorphosis. And again, sometimes those pupil are going to be found in a drier substrate, off from where you would find the larval stages, kind of hidden um, under debris, under um, whatever feed sources may be utilized, and, and things like that. So they can kind of go unnoticed. Um, and sometimes some of them bury themselves, and then those flies have to emerge and dig through. The dirt. So the horn fly is the most impacting when it comes to the beef cattle industry. It is found almost exclusively with cattle. They will bite on other livestock. So if you have cattle near or horses near cattle, or if you have bison, you're definitely going to see them too. Um, but if you have other animals that are out there, there is potential for those horn flies to bite on those other animals while they're out there feeding. Uh, but they do solely rely on those beef 
cattle for their survivability. Uh, they take many blood meals a day and both males and females are blood feeders. And that can be very impacting to your animals if they're being bitten on a regular basis because they're not designed to take a large blood meal. They take many small blood meals throughout the day. And, and it really can be very frustrating. The eggs are going to be found in what we call fresh manure um, and, and think really fresh. So they like to get down in there. As soon as that manure has kind of fallen to the ground, the females hop down in there, lay their eggs in it, and then they'll kind of get that crust over layer and then the larva will grow inside there. Um, the stages, again, they take about one to two weeks for development. It depends on temperature. Uh, for us down here in the south, they're growing really fast right now. But for those of you a little further north than me, you may be still seeing some cooler nights and it may be slowing down their development. Uh, cattle are going to react to their presence by throwing their heads and spitting on themselves and licking as much as they can because they're trying to block, knock those flies off, as well as twitching and swishing their tails um, to kick off those flies as much as they possibly can. Currently, the, the threshold is um, for the economic threshold for horn flies is 200 to 250 flies per animal. Um, and that's really seems kind of, wow, that's a lot of flies. That's not a lot of flies. That's a very minimal amount of flies for most uh, situations. This animal here is way more than that already. Um, but this is a, for geographical debate because some cattle in some areas can handle more. What it really comes down to is when are the cattle upset? How many flies does it take to make your cows to be disrupted by that feeding? Because that feeding hurts. And if they're more worried about the feeding and the biting, then feeding themselves, that's when you're going to have an impact. Um, and we don't normally see like so much as a weight lost unless it's really young cattle. What we're seeing is a lack of weight gain um, because mama may be too distracted to stand there long enough to feed and you're going to see that impact. Or if you're dealing with heifers or stalkers, they're too distracted long enough to consume and that's when you'll have just an impact to their weight gain. The next one is the stable fly, uh, another biting fly that we see in um, in more springtime weather. It, it's a cooler species, uh, weather species. It doesn't do well once you've like gotten to the 90s. Um, so for those of you that are, are in different states than myself, you probably are still dealing with them. But I will tell you, we still have them right now, too, in Texas because we've had rain. Uh, so we will start to see them in the springtime and they can keep going for several months and they're very irritating. They're ankle biters. They bite really on the lower part of the leg, both males and females. Um, but they do that similar to a mosquito taking these large blood meals all at one time. So their bite is limited. You're only going to usually have that one fly on you once a day. Uh, they do have to go off and digest that food. So um, it gets really tough to manage them because of those reasons. The other thing that's interesting about stable flies is while we will find them around situations where manure is present, they really are more inclined to be where there's vegetation that's present and not necessarily the manure. When you have a problem with them, you'll see your animals kind of kicking and stamping their legs to try and fight them off again because they're on the ankles or on the lower part of the leg a really big problem in our dairies and our feedlot production groups because of the way that those animals are kind of grouped together and the way the manure is managed. So control measures for dealing with these biting flies, again, just like with house flies, we want to use the biological controls, which is, you know, using our parasitoids, cultural control, which, you know, if you can rotate pastures, if you have pastured animals to try and clean up the old pasture and get rid of that old manure, that is always great. It's a little trickier when we're dealing with a pastured situation, break up those old manure pads and even utilizing of traps in the mechanical side, and then the usage of chemicals. But again, it's all about proper usage of these chemicals. So the parasitoid wasps, they're again going to lay their eggs inside those larvae. Uh, be sure if you use these that you buy the right product. There are different wasps out there. They do have host specificity, but all the ones that you purchase for flies are, are pretty much designed for all three of these house flies, horn flies, and their stable flies. For cultural control, a little harder to do like it is with the beef pasture, so to speak, when dealing with horn flies, that's just going to be kind of get rid of the manure pats when you can. But, you know, if you have a lot of cows, that's a lot of work and that's not something you may be able to do. Um, but when dealing with hay bales, 
this is highly important to manage these bales and the excess. It's what's not being eaten anymore because those are the breeding sites for stable flies. Um, so you want to kind of get in there every time you bring out a new hay bale, clean up around the old hay bale, take the old hay away, burn it if possible. Um, if not, discard it somewhere else, do some compost pile um, or, or just drag it out real, really, really thin, less than a quarter of an inch. Cause you want to stop that production because that hay will stay usable and viable for fly production for many, many months if it's getting wet. And that can be both rain or urine that can cause that. With our stable flies, we do have some traps that are on the market that can be utilized. Uh, the trap in the center is easily accessible. It's you know usually at a feed, a feed store locally, maybe not the most effective trap. Um, I'm actually a really big fan of the one all the way on the right, which is our nightstick. Well, it's my right, hopefully Joel's right too. <laughs> so, and you can see the numbers there. And the, that little study we did, it was four days of collections and we had collected 1800 plus with just that one trap out there. Um, and there were many other traps on site as well. And that one just did amazing. So definitely one I would recommend. Now traps are a tool that assists. It's not going to get rid of the problem, unfortunately, but it will help take some of those adults out of the, um, out of the area, right? When dealing with horn flies, we have a lot of products on the market. Most of these products, we market them for horn flies because that's our highest area where we're seeing the most impact, but they can have overreaching of impact too so to some of these other flies. Uh, so feed through products, those are, are consumed and they're insect growth regulators that impact both horse flies and house flies mostly and sometimes stable flies if they're going to be in that same manure source, um, using porons that are designed for ectoparasites, for ectoparasite treatment. Um, make sure you use the proper porons. These are going to be permethrin based for the most part, some type of a pyrethroid. Um, they'll circulate and react when the animal, when the flies try to bite. These may not work 100% well with stable flies, but they do work well with horn flies and with horse flies. Back rubs and dust bags and sprays, these um, are, you know, have different types of ways that you can approach these. The back rubs and dust bags are things you can put out and let the animals self-treat um, with whatever you feel comfortable putting into those. Um, a sprayer, this one is, is obviously a rig that's designed to utilize when you're bringing your cows in and working them. You'd have to bring them in and run them through. You can do it that way or you can do a handheld spray of some sort or something off the back of your truck if you prefer that. Those products don't last super long, but there's a lot of them out there and they can be effective if, if done correctly. Ear tags um, obviously are a little bit of a different option than some of these others. They go into the ears of the animals, as it says. You would want to put two per animal to get your best results. And these are a slow release um, of chemical over time. They are best for horn flies um, and ticks, to be really honest, because we get a lot of ticks up around the head. They're going to have minimal to no impact on any other flies. And it's just because of proximity. You're just not going to have the stable fly coming up on the head, um, minimal to no impact onto the house flies. And if you have face flies in your area, those two are not going to be impacted by ear tags. The vet gun. That can be popular in some areas. Uh, obviously, this is something you're shooting at your animals, so that may be a concern, but most of the animals can handle it without much, without being too upset by it. Uh, so it is a great tool, but it does require the animal to be over 600 pounds to shoot at, to shoot a cap at them, the vet cap, um, and there is some rotation ability with these products. And then real quick, just to wrap up, I wanted to briefly mention horse flies because horse flies can be a concern when we're talking of vectors, uh, vectoring species in addition to stable flies and horn flies, which are also impact are also implicated in having some concerns with the transmission of mastitis between our, our cattle. We have horse flies, which can also impact both cattle and horses. Horse flies um, and deer flies, technically speaking, and those are two different uh, members of this one family of flies. The horse flies are generally larger. The deer flies are generally smaller um, in size. So that's why there's such a range here in the sizes. But with all of them though, only females are blood feeders because the blood is needed for egg production. So males do not bite. The female will only bite once, about once a week. Um, so really hard to control them with chemicals because they're not there very long. And the next one you see is not the same one you saw the day before um, because of that. They do lay their eggs on, on stones and vegetation near water. 
Um, the deer flies are known to be in more wet si si situations than the horse flies, but they're still looking for a wet substrate. So kind of a mud, um, the wetter the mud, less likely you'll see the horn horse flies and the more wet the mud, you'll see the deer fly uh, immature stage. And it's very hard to find those larvae. The larvae are extremely predaceous. So you usually only see one or two around a single pond, a large pond, um, because if they find each other, they'll eat each other. Um, if there's other things out there to eat, they'll eat them first. And the biggest impact we see in most of our states is going to be that they is the um, potential to vector equine infectious anemia virus and anthrax, which are very common in um, a lot of our states. If you're dealing with horse flies, uh, it's really hard to get management that's effective with them. One of the main reasons is their limited impact on to chemicals, um, but there are several traps out there on the market that you can eventually, that you could try out. These are attractant traps with no chemicals. Um, so they can be placed in a lot of areas uh, to bring those flies in to these sites and just be collected up at the top of them.